apply whether you're in Sunfield or other parts of the ETJ. Um, but on the, on the map here, you can see the city limits line is in red. Uh, anything outside of that red boundary, including Sunfield, is technically not in the city limits. So Leisurewood, uh, Coast of Cimarron, um, Stone Field, uh, and Sunfield are all neighborhoods that are not included in the city limits. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of y'all live in Sunfield? Kind of gauge the audience. Yeah, okay, good. And if you're not here, in, if you don't live in Sunfield, again, uh, some of this will apply to you and some of you will not. After the 2020 census, we looked at our population estimates and have used the 2020 census to be a baseline as we move forward and update those. Uh, this is something that our development services staff put together, but we're estimating as of 2023 that we have just under 17,000 people that live in the city limits proper. Uh, but you can see we have another 27,000 almost that live in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So even though we, we call ourselves a city of 17,000, when we add in the, the ETJ, we're a city that's closer to almost 40,000 people. Uh, in Sunfield alone, uh, you can see that the population of, of uh, that TTJ area is primarily driven by Sunfield and the number of homes that are out there. About 13,000 uh, residents in, uh, I'm sorry, closer to seven, uh, almost 18,000 residents in Sunfield alone, uh, compared to just a little over 8,500 in the rest of the ETJ areas of the city. And as I mentioned, if you don't know what an ETJ is, we would start the conversation with definitions. So uh, just to think, uh, set the conversation, here's some terms that we're going to refer to throughout the conversation. An extraterritorial jurisdiction is the an area immediately around a city that the state of Texas is determined to be under some control or limited control of the city in order to protect the health, the general health, safety, and wellness of people that reside in that area. And this is found in Local Government Code, Chapter 42. We're also going to be referring to municipal utility districts or MUDs because that is what Sunfield is. They created their own governmental uh, entity uh, to govern the area. And the MUD is a special taxing district created under Chapter 54 of the Texas Water Code. We're also going to talk about limited purpose annexations. And these are negotiated annexations where the city collects sales tax but not property tax in these areas. And we actually have uh, two limited purpose annexation areas. Uh, for the city of Utah. The first is the commercial area in Sunfield, uh, right? It's kind of a hatched area, that's why it's uh, differentiated here. And then we have another limited purpose annexation along Robert S. Light, uh, where they get those new townhomes and things have gone in down there, along with this area um, of Stone Field is also a limited purpose annexation area. To give a little history, uh, I was not here in 2003, and none of the staff were here in 2003, so we can't really speak to the creation. All we can do is look at the documents and the agreements that were, were formalized at the time and try to piece together what we know about of how the, the municipal utility district was created. But it was created in 2003. Uh, the city of Utah in 2003 was obviously much smaller, and it was pretty much concentrated on the west side of I-35 and downtown. Uh, the stuff out in West Utah with Garlic Creek, Whispering Hollow, uh, that area hadn't developed quite yet. I think Colon Country may have, have happened. Oxbow was out in the country, uh, as well as was Leisurewood and uh, Coast of Cimarron. Um, but in 2003, uh, Sunfield, the uh, developer, came to the city and said, we want to create this community in your extraterritorial jurisdiction, and under state law, the city would have to give its consent. Uh, we're going through this right now with the uh, persimmon project, if you've been following that, and the milestone development. They're, they're looking at two options. They, their first option is they want to come into the city and develop under the city's regulations, but if that's not granted, then they're looking at creating a mud and forming that outside of the city. And cities can, can, create, can uh, give that consent and work with them to, uh, to create the mud, or cities can, don't have to give that consent. And if that's the case, then they can go to the state legislator or TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and seek to have the mud created that way without the city's consent. Uh, but with this mud consent for, for Sunfield, um, the city negotiated that we would create the limited purpose annexation areas. Again, that hatched area where more of the commercial growth is happening. Um, and again, we don't get property tax from that area, just any sales tax that's generated there. And then the city also agreed to not annex Sunfield until at least 2036, 30 years from when the uh, MUD 1 and MUD 2 were created. 
there are several MUDs uh, that operate within Sunfield. So depending on where you live in Sunfield, you may have a different MUD board that you report to. Uh, but MUD 1 was the first one that was created. Again, a lot of that is the area along the Firecracker and uh, the northern part of Main Street. Uh, MUD 3 is uh, wrapping up development right now. And you can see based on the aerial images that uh, Sunfield is now developing into MUD 4. You're about to have a bunch of new neighbors to the southeast side of Sunfield. And then MUD 2 is up to the north, and that has not been developed yet. Um, and part of the, the challenges that the developer will have to go through with that is that actually lies within Austin or um, Travis County DTJ. So uh, there's different rules that will be working through in that area. These are your MUD boards. These are elected residents of your neighborhood. So if you ever have a question about um, who represents you in terms of, of your local government as a MUD, uh, these are the representatives from MUD 1 and 2. So if you go to an election, uh, and you probably are voting here or at Sunfield Station, those are the two primary voting locations in Utah, um, but you wouldn't see city council members listed on the election, you'd see your MUD board representatives listed on the election. And then for MUD 3 and 4, these are your elected officials. So what does a municipal utility district do? Well, one, they issue bonds. So just like a city can issue bonds for infrastructure projects, uh, so does a MUD. So they are issuing bonds for water, wastewater, drainage projects, um, and, and of course, transportation and park projects as well. They have the same ability to levy and collect taxes as a city does. And then they are operating, again, like a city. They're out there constructing and operating the water lines, the sewer lines, drainage roads, parks, and facilities. Um, just to give you a comparison of who Sunfield residents get their services from versus who City of Utah residents get their services from. For water, uh, Sunfield uh, is served by Go Forth uh, Special Utility Districts. I think that if you live in Sunfield, I confirm this, that you get, a, you get a one bill from Go Forth, but it includes your water, your sewer, and your, uh, your trash service, so tell me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but that's an agreement that Sunfield has worked out with Go Forth is doing the billing. But the wastewater is actually provided by GBRA. Y'all own a, or GBRA now owns a wastewater treatment plant on the southern part of the, the project that was built by the Sunfield developer uh, that is not operated with the city, operated by the city of Utah. Solid waste, uh, y'all have a different contract. Sunfield residents have a different contract with Texas Disposal Systems than the city does. The city also uses TDS, uh, but we have a different contract that was negotiated by the city. If uh, you have emergency services needs, you call the police department. Uh, in Sunfield, you're actually going to get Hayes County Sheriff's Office, not City of Utah. We do have dual response uh, or emergency response agreement, so it is possible that uh, if Hayes County Sheriff's Office are backed up on calls, you could see a City of Utah police officer respond, uh, but primarily it would be the Sheriff's Office or even the Constable's Office. Fire and EMS, uh, we do have overlap here. Uh, the city does not have a fire department or uh, EMS service. Uh, we have uh, an emergency service district here with the city. It's its own separate taxing entity. Uh, and so they operate here. ESD, ESD number eight is the fire. ESD number two is EMS. Uh, for y'all, for road maintenance, that is done by the MUD. The MUD uh, maintains and controls and repairs some of the roads. And Hayes County uh, controls and maintains some of the roads as well. Uh, whereas here in the city of Utah, it's the local street, the city of Utah is responsible for it. Parks, y'all have amazing parks in Sunfield. Uh, you pay for them as part of your, your, uh, your uh, HOA dues as well as part of your mud taxes. Um, but as Sunfield residents, y'all are more than welcome to come over and use City of Utah Parks as well. Uh, we do have Stone Ridge and Stonefield, I'm sorry, Stone Ridge and Green Meadows parks on the east side of I-35, and then uh, as well as many parks on the west side of I-35. And as part of our bond program, we're looking to buy and, and build potentially a, a large regional park on the east side of Utah as well in the future. Uh, for library services, any Hayes County uh, resident can use any Hayes County library. So I know a lot of Sunfield residents have library cards here. You're not charged an extra fee for doing that through an agreement we have with Hayes County. Uh, Hayes County helps fund some of the, the local libraries, and so again, any resident can use any library, any public library. In terms of taxes, uh, again, if you live in this in the ETJ, you do not pay a city of Utah property tax, but you do pay a municipal utility district tax, which is not, not imposed by the city, it's imposed by the, the MUD that was created 
that you live in. So if you live in, in Sunfield, your total tax um, rate is about $2.80, 81 cents. Um, if you live in the city, the total tax rate is $2.25. When you take into account city, school, county, DESDs, and ACC districts as well. And then this one I think is the, my favorite slide to show because uh, it talks about what laws apply in the TJ versus the city. Uh, mostly, no city ordinance, most city ordinances do not apply in the ETJ. There are a few exceptions, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so zoning regulations. The city has no zoning control over what gets built in the ETJ or the county in terms of actual zoning. Um, we do, however, have subdivision regulations. And unless you work in city government, you probably don't understand what the difference is between those. So I'm going to explain for a second. Uh, zoning regulation is based on the use, so it, it, it may be a daycare or a gas station or whatever other use you can think of. Subdivision regulation, on the other hand, the other hand is how it's actually built, how it's laid out, um, how it, the site plan is laid out. So it doesn't take into account use, but it looks at, again, meeting the city's requirements for setbacks and the building needs to be so far back from the property line that it has to have stormwater detention, those types of things. Uh, the city also has regulation over sign permits and standards. Again, these are things that are, are given to cities under state law, uh, and these, these things that the city can enforce in the ETJ were set into place because uh, at the time that the laws were passed, uh, that the city, the city could annex, and these areas could become part of the city in the future. So it makes sense to make the, the buildings and how they're lined out cohesive with the rest of the community. The city also has a tree mitigation or tree removal <coughs> process, and this also applies in the ETJ, but only to new development and new growth. If you are um, doing something on your private property, I don't really, I believe it applies to you, but if, if a new <coughs> subdivision is being built or a new commercial building is being built, then the tree mitigation standards apply. The city does not issue building permits or certificates of occupancy in the ETJ. So if you need, if you're having electrical work, plumbing work done, at your house or your business, you don't come to the city of data for a building permit. Um, that we, we don't uh, control that in the ETJ. The city of Utah also has an animal control ordinance, uh, so that applies in the city of Utah. It does not apply in the ETJ. I'm not sure if the county has certain regulations, but like in the, in the city, you can only have up to four. I believe it's four combination of dogs and cats at your house. Um, we also have you know restrictions on chickens and those kinds of things. And the county. Um, Again, I'm not sure that the city regulations do not apply, but your HOA may also have some regulations and, and more than likely do. Fire regulations do apply in both in the city and in the county uh, because, again, we're not a, a, a jurisdiction for fire, but we work with the ESD um, and because they have the same standards uh, within their entire district. They're, they're the same whether you're in the city or the ETJ. Code enforcement, so this is tall grass, uh, trash on your property, junk vehicles, that kind of thing. The city has regulations about that, uh, but we cannot enforce those standards in the ETJ. Again, your HOA very much has those, and I'm sure you've seen or, or maybe personally gotten one of those letters from your HOA. But again, those, are, those code enforcement issues are never coming from the city of Peta. Uh, right now, we're in, a, we're, in, we're in a drought. So the city of Peta water customers are in drought stage two. Um, so we are restricting City of Utah of water customers water in one, one day per week right now. Um, you have water restrictions in your neighborhood as well, but they're free to go for. So their, their restrictions are going to be different than what the City of Utah restrictions are. So you always want to make sure to check who your utility provider is and monitor what those restrictions are because they may not match what the city has. And then we do have a variety of nuisance regulations. Uh, so we can, under state law, enforce fireworks into our ETJ. Uh, we also, uh, if there's, you know, a, I'll give you an example. We had a composting facility that was built uh, on the edge of town, not in the city, but just outside the city, and it was making it uncomfortable for the neighbors that live there. So we have an ordinance that says, all right, you can't produce foul smelling order odors that are affecting residents in the city of Utah. So those two nuisance regulations apply whether you're in the city or the ETJ. Anybody have any questions on these before I move on? Yes, sir. Fireworks. So, do you know why? I mean, there was a restriction, a ban 
the last 4th of July and was super dry, you could have also done a ban in the EDJ? The city's, uh, the, so the question is, uh, I'm repeating it for the last year, it was the, that there was a ban in the ETJ for fireworks this last 4th of July. In the, the city. In the city. Well, the city, the city never allows fireworks in the city limits, regardless of drought or anything like that. We have an ordinance that says no fireworks. Um, but in the ETJ, um, the city's regulations apply to within 5,000 feet of the city limits, which includes our ETJ. And again, that is because um, once state law allows it, but the it, it could pose a risk to the city of Utah residents if a fire started in the ETJ and spreads to the city. Well, I guess then, I mean, when they put the signs up, they put them at the city limits, which I think was confusing for people. Yeah, we put them up in our city limits. Yeah. Um, and that's the primary area that we are enforcing. We wouldn't necessarily go out to the ETJ and enforce it unless there was some, uh, we got complaints of nuisance, like it's, it's 4 a.m. in the morning and fireworks are going off, then you may get a visit from a city of Utah police officer or there's a, a fire risk. Question in the back. Any other questions about the laws that apply? You'll have an opportunity later too, so if you think of something, uh, please stop us. Uh, this slide is about elections, and the, the question is, can I vote in city election? And the answer is sometimes. You actually can vote in city elections sometimes. For city council elections, the answer is no. You don't get to vote for a city council person because they do not represent you in the ETJ. For bond elections, the answer is no. For city bond elections, there's school district bonds, and there's county bonds, and there's other things. You don't vote on those either because your property taxes are not going back to pay uh, a city bond. Um, but a, a weird quirk in state law is that with charter elections, a charter is the founding document or constitution of how a city is created. So it, it outlines the powers and duties of city council, of staff, all of that. Um, anytime you have a charter election under state law, you all can vote in that. And uh, we may have a charter election coming up this November or next November, depending on when city council decides to call it. Um, but you'll see that on your, your ballot if you live in the ETJ and you'll have an opportunity to vote on charter election things. Because again, the thought is that under state law when ETJs were created, that at some point the area would be annexed and you become a city resident. So you get to help shape how it's, it's, it organized and operates. Uh, we already talked about the, the MUD Board of Directors. Um, you also have a um, group that uh, manages the MUD, and that's Murphy Engineering, if you ever want to look them up. And then again, you are represented by Hayes County Commissioners Court as well. 